but these practices are generally kept under wraps, not to be talked about, total state secrets. But I do know that there's some professional and amateur bodybuilders out there that dabble a little bit with EPO. Personally, I've never used anything like EPO or some of its derivatives. So I had to do a lot of research and discuss some of these protocols with my athletes. And it also means that I'm not going to go into exact protocols on what you need to do because I don't exactly know what you're doing on the other end of this YouTube video. So we're going to go with the medical dosages, which are approved in particular medical conditions. Um, you might have to go a little bit higher or you might have to go a little bit lower. But if you don't have access to frequent blood work, CT scans and MRIs, then I would just advise you to stay clear, right? These compounds are meant to be respected. It's next level performance enhancing drug use because dying of a blood clot is quite acute. If you go hypoglycemic from using insulin a little bit too much, you can eat your way out of it, but you can't eat your way or drug your way out of a blood clot, right? So guys, please proceed with caution. Still, I want to present this information to you so you know what's on the table if you want to improve your overall endurance. So let's get started with erythropoietin, EPO, unfortunately included in the prohibited list since 1990, I believe, albeit that the first tests were available from 2000 onwards, and the first victim of WADA that was using erythropoietin to improve one's endurance in cycling, of course, uh, failed the doping test in 2001. So it's found under the peptide hormones, growth factors, and related sub substances and mimetics. One, erythropoietins. And there's all of the compounds which we're going to discuss in this video are actually classified there. That's erythropoietin, EPO, as well as methoxypolyethylene glycol epoietin beta, also known as Sura or Mersura, and dermopoietin, D-EPO. All of those three we're going to discuss in this video, all three included on the prohibited list. So proceed with caution if you're a tested athlete. Erythropoietin is produced through human recombinant technology. Recombinant human erythropoietin is available, also known as hematopoietin or hemopoietin. I couldn't find the molecular formula, so if you can find it, you know, the amount of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms which are contained within EPO, what I was able to piece together is that the molecular weight of EPO is 30.4 kilodalton, so that's 50% higher than the kilodalton molecular weight of growth hormone fluctuating anywhere between 20 to what was it, 24 kilodaltons. Classification of EPO, of course, is uh, erythropoiesis stimulating agents. The half-life depends on the administration route. Intravenous, the half-life is anywhere between 6.1 to 10.9 hours. And if you administer it subcutaneously, the half-life is anywhere between 8.7 to 30.1 hours. Again, we're going with the scientific literature here. The effective medical dosages, guys, in case of Chemotherapy is 150 IUs EPO per one kilogram of body weight subcutaneous three times per week. For coronary kidney failure, that's anywhere between 50 IUs to 100 IUs per one kilogram of body weight intravenous or subcutaneous three times per week. And anemia from surgery, 300 IUs per one kilogram of body weight sub Q 10 days before the surgery. So kind of front loads if they are going to expect that you're going to undergo a lot of blood loss during surgery. Then on the day of the surgery, for four consecutive days after surgery, again, another 300 IU per one kilogram of body weight subcutaneously. Now, there are several biosimilar products which are available as recombinant human EPO. Those are epoetin alpha, epoetin beta, and epoetin zeta. These are biosimilar because the amino acid structure is the same as um, you know endogenously produced erythropoietin. But the carbohydrate structure, this is why the molecular weight is so high, 40% of EPO is actually carbohydrate. Certainly not ketogenic diets approved. It might even kick you out of ketosis if you start IVing a boatload of EPO, whether that's the alpha, beta, or zeta variant, because again, containing a decent amount of carbohydrates. But then again, a ketogenic diet isn't really good for endurance. You would need some carbohydrates and maybe some aldronate and maybe some insulin to shuttle those carbohydrates in for mitochondrial uh, function and ATP synthesis. And then you provide all of the oxygen with EPO or uh, similar biosimilar products. It's all starting to make sense now. Okay, so what are the functions of EPO? This is the same for all of the compounds which we're going to discuss in this video. Increase oxygen carrying capacity by increasing your red blood cell count and overall hematocrit and thus improving one's endurance. If you're not hindering your endurance with anabolic and steroids 
or some of the other compounds which can lower your endurance, improved aerobic performance, enhanced recovery, which is slightly speculated because again, EPO improves or might improve the recovery process by aiding in repairing damaged tissues and replenishing oxygen stores through the increased red blood cells. Keep in mind, besides the increased oxygen carrying capacity, delivering oxygen from the lungs into metabolically active tissues, preferably skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle then produces CO2, carbon dioxide. And guess how that gets back to the lungs for you to exhale it? Red blood cells, baby. So the increased red blood cells is not only the delivery of oxygen, also the removal of metabolic waste products, specifically carbon dioxide. So the increased likelihood for acidosis within skeletal muscle now also goes down, especially if you start combining that with compounds like citrulline malate, beta alanine to help with the acid buffer, or uh, baking soda, sodium bicarbonate, which we discussed in part one and two of the enhanced endurance deep dive video series. All right, so all of this can be readily combined. This is also one of the reasons why some of the more advanced professional bodybuilders tend to use a little bit of EPO here and there, but these practices are generally kept under wraps, not to be talked about, total state secrets. But I do know that there's some professional and amateur bodybuilders out there that dabble a little bit with EPO, albeit that these guys are living the lifestyle 100% and they have access to all of the blood work uh, places and can do therapeutic blood donations and do the occasional MRI or CT scan just to make sure that they don't have any plaque or obstructions in their blood vessels, right? These guys are highly on point and they spend an arm and a leg to stay healthy while using EPOs and other performance enhancing drugs. So um, again, these kinds of compounds come with a laundry list of prerequisites because blood, blood clots, stroke, cardiovascular problems, right? Other potentially life-threatening complications are all serious side effects of EPO. Um, again, make sure that you check your serum hematocrit, red blood cell count, platelets, and hemoglobin every two weeks throughout the entire course that you might be using recombinant human, erythropoietin, whether that's the alpha, beta, or zeta variants. Now, another variant of erythropoietin is, uh, like I alluded earlier, methoxy polyethylene glycol epoietin beta, also known as Sera or Mercera, included in the WADA prohibited list. Uh, I couldn't find the molecular formula, unfortunately. So if you happen to know, you would like to contribute to the contents of this video, let us know in the comment section the amount of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, and whatever else this Sera or Mercera contains. I do know the molecular weight, 60 kilodaltons. So that's twice as heavy as recombinant human erythropoietin, R-H-E-P-O. Um, why is that? Well, uh, Sera, Mercera, contains methoxy polyethylene glycol and thus has a much higher molecular weight because this uh, methoxy polyethylene glycol, besides some modifications to the carbohydrate structure, um, this gives it a very long active life. The half-life is 130 to 137 hours. So that's what? Um, let's say an average 10 times higher, depending on the administration routes over a common human EPO. And it also means that you only have to inject this uh, sera or mercera at 0 0.6 microgram per one kilogram of body weight or up to 1.2 micrograms per one kilogram of body weight, subcutaneous or intravenously, once every two weeks, but preferably monthly. This is only in the context of chronic kidney disease. Personally, I've never talked to anybody who's used this compound. I do know that it's on the market. I do know that it's prohibited. And of course, you know, if you're looking for compounds that you shouldn't be using, the World Anti-Doping Agency prohibited list is probably the best source to get inspired. So this is only used in a case of chronic, chronic kidney disease. And just like with erythropoietin, you know, the main biological functions and effects is increased red blood cell production, improved oxygen delivery, and the corrections for anemia in particular medical conditions. So, um, you know, it's basically the same as EPO, albeit a longer lasting version. And then the last one I want to discuss, darbopoietin alpha, also known as Aranesp, also on the prohibited list, so let's not waste too much time on that. The molecular formula is on the screen. I was able to find it. The molecular weight of darbopoietin alpha is 40 kilodaltons, so not as heavy as Sera Mercera, but about 50% heavier than a recombinant human EPO. And that's because darbopoietin alpha is a re-engineered form of erythropoietin containing five amino acid changes. So there's no changes in the carbohydrate structure, but in this context, the amino acids are changed and thus the half-life is also significantly longer. Depending on the administration route, it could be anywhere between 48.8 hours 
to 69.6 hours after a single administration. The effective medical dosages for chronic kidney failure are between 0.45 micrograms to 0.75 micrograms per one kilogram of body weight, either subcutaneous or intravenous, once per week or once every two weeks. And for cancer chemotherapy, that goes as high as 2.25 micrograms per one kilogram of body weight, either subcutaneous or intravenously, once weekly, or 500 micrograms sub-Q every three weeks. So those are pretty high dosages, right? Biological functions, the exact same as erythropoietin, alpha, beta, or zeta, or the sera or mercera with the impronounceable long name, right? Increased blood blood cell count, improved oxygen delivery, and enhanced aerobic capacity. All these three have a larger list of prerequisites. Uh, You really need to do your due diligence before you start using them and do a ton of research on how they're metabolized. And, um, you know, what other stuff you need to pay extra special attention to that I might omit from this video to, you know, be respectful of your time. Still, do your research before you start dabbling.